we're presenting the case of an 11-year-old girl from Madagascar with bilateral intraocular cystosarcosis. The surgery was performed by Mr. Anthony Hall <coughs> and she was referred from Madagascar by Mr. Henry Nkumbi. My name is James Pym and I'm a GP in Reading. The 11-year-old girl presented to Madagascar Clinic in March 2010 with a one-week history of loss of vision in both eyes and a white object floating in her central visual field. Her vision was reduced to counting fingers at one metre. Her left fundus photograph shows, as you can see, a submacular cyst with inflammatory cells in the vitreous. Her right eye contains a free-floating intravitreal cyst and a large submacular cyst with an adjacent retinal hemorrhage. Comparing the upper photograph with the lower one taken a short time later, one can see the movement of the scolex, as if responding to light. The free-floating cyst has caused a local inflammatory reaction, with partial detachment of the hyaloid, delineated here by inflammatory cells. There is atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium near these peripheral subretinal cysts. This sequence of photographs shows movement of the scolex at the lower pole of the intravitreal cyst. A total of six cysts were visualised in both eyes. Serology was positive for cystosarcosis and a CT brain was negative for cysts. She was transferred to KCMC in Tanzania for vitreoretinal surgery by Mr Anthony Hall, which took place on the 20th of April 2010. A three-port vitrectomy to remove the intraocular cysts was performed on both eyes. The right eye had four cysts, one of which can be seen moving freely in the vitreous cavity. It is essential to induce a posterior vitreous detachment to allow access to the retina, preventing subsequent membrane formation which might cause retinal detachment. Peripheral vitreous is trimmed off a subretinal cyst situated in the temporal region allowing access to the cyst. A flute needle is used to gently remove the cyst from the eye. Gentle endodiathermy is used to create a small retinotomy over the subretinal cyst. The flute needle gently eases the cyst through the retinotomy. The cyst is then grasped with retinal forceps and pulled from the subretinal space. The retinotomy seen behind the freed cyst is smaller than the cyst diameter since the cyst and retina distort and stretch as the cyst is delivered. The larva appears much larger than its true size, being greatly magnified by the lens of the eye. Peripheral vitreous is peeled and trimmed away from the area near the retinotomy. The second peripheral cyst is removed in the same manner. The retinotomy for the submacular cyst is made at the temporal edge of the cyst in the horizontal meridian. An air fluid exchange is performed and residual subretinal fluid removed. Gentle laser is applied to the edges of the retinotomies. The eye is filled with silicon oil to tamponade the retinotomies. Removal of the two cysts from her left eye followed the same procedure. All cysts were removed intact. It is important to deliver the cyst intact as rupture of the cyst will cause an inflammatory host response to the foreign protein. Removal was achieved by gentle handling of the cysts, patiently coaxing them through the retinotomies, allowing the cysts to change shape and the retina to stretch. Intraocular cysticercosis is caused by the migration of tinea solium or tapeworm oncospheres through the human gut via the circulation to the eye where the cysts form. The cysticerci remain alive for many years slowly enlarging and grazing on subretinal tissues near the blood vessels of entry to the eye. Intraocular cystosarcosis is uh, something that happens when the intermediate host is bypassed 
and there is uh, self-infection or auto-infection via the fecal-oral route. In the normal cycle, the pig is the intermediate host, and the pig eats contaminated vegetation in which there are eggs or gravid segments. The pork that's acquired from the pig is uh, butchered and the meat is not inspected for cysts. The human host would then eat uh, the pork, uh, not killed sufficiently to kill the cyst, and uh, cystocerci from the meat will attach to the intestine of the human host by the scolex and one or two will grow into an adult tapeworm. The tapeworm shed segments or proglottids which carry enormous numbers of eggs and faeces. One can prevent auto-infection, of course, by proper hand washing. The ocular manifestation of cystocercosis inevitably leads to blindness within three or five years after the natural death of the parasite releases foreign protein causing a host reaction. In a series of 45 cases reported by Sharma and Sinha in India, the common presenting symptoms were reduced vision and floaters. Seven patients gave a history of seizures. In their series, only 64% of cysts were removed intact, and complications included iatrogenic cyst rupture, epiretinal membrane formation, cataract, and retinal detachment. Only one patient in their series had bilateral eye cysts, and none had more than two cysts. The rather high complication rate in their series can be attributed to rupture of cysts and the largest size at presentation. On her return to Madagascar, the patient was treated with 30 mg oral prednisolone daily for 5 days as well as 200 mg albendazole twice daily for 15 days to induce involution of any remaining cysts elsewhere in the body with a minimal inflammatory response. Followed up at 9 months postoperatively, she had hypermetropia induced by silicon oil and was using 8.5 diopter sphere prescription for the right and 8.0 diopter sphere prescription for her left eye. Her best corrected vision was 336 and 324. She was scheduled for removal of silicon oil and treatment of posterior capsule opacities at one year postoperatively. She has had no neurological manifestation of cysticercosis. The treatment was facilitated by Madagascar Organization for Saving Sight, MOS, and CBM. Surgery was undertaken in the KCMC Hospital, Moshi, Tanzania.